Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first edition of Dirtfish Debates. Listen, I really do hope that everyone is keeping well and keeping safe wherever you might be around the world. And what we're trying to do here at Dirtfish is to bring you as much news, as much information, as much entertainment from the world of rallying as we can. And in that regard, we have three of the biggest names, possibly the three most important men in the service park joining us today for Dirtfish Debates. They really don't need introducing, but I'm going to introduce them anyway because we want to know where they're sitting this morning. So we'll start with you, Andrea, because your face is on my screen. A very good morning from Hyundai to Andrea Adamo. Andrea, how are you doing? How are you keeping? I'm okay. I'm uh, trying to lose weight and try to stay healthy. Of course, I try to make the best out of this uh, tricky moment for everyone. So mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm I'm in Germany, and uh, okay, I live on the hills uh, here. So I always live alone. So the situation didn't change the, a lot for me. But uh, that's it. We are waiting to authorize to go back uh, to work. Uh, Somehow. Yeah, well, I tell you what, Andrea, you're looking more like Bruce Willis by the day. You really are. Uh, good to have you with us this morning. Yeah, but Colin, I uh, hope to say that because people think that I'm paying you <laughs> monthly. Uh, yeah, I'll stop with that. You're quite nice. I bet I have to get a girlfriend, you know, it looks like that it's very well planned. <laughs> Andrea, it's a delight always to have you. Joining us, obviously, from Finland, it is the boss of the Toyota Gazoo Racing Team. A very, very good morning to you, Tommy Mackinnon. Tommy, how are you doing? How are you keeping? And whereabouts are you this morning? Good morning in, in Uvascular. Uvascular at home and doing well. We all, our team has avoided any trouble with, uh, with the coronavirus. And uh, just uh, mostly stay at home and... Uh, at the farm and doing some uh, some uh, different work and uh, exercising mo very different ways, walking in the forest and whatever. It's uh, as you know, we have a uh, lots of countryside and it's uh, it's quite a, quite a basically good situation for us. Even it is very serious. Uh, our population and everything. Our, our virus is not such a Serious. It's serious, but our government has done very good work. Tommy, great to have you this morning. Tommy, great to see you looking so well uh, also. Now, the third of our mega players from the service park, it's the M Sport Ford uh, team principal. It is Richard Milner. Richard, a very, very good morning to you. I think I know where you are, but tell us where you are and tell us how you've been keeping. Yeah, we're all good, thanks. Um, just at home in my uh, little spare room. But uh, looking after ourselves and the weather in the UK is perfect at the moment. But we're all unfortunately stuck inside, really. So um, just got to deal with the situation and uh, hopefully we can get back to, to normal soon. Fantastic. Gents, listen, uh, really, we massively appreciate you joining us this morning. And perhaps we appreciate a little more the questions that have come in from all of our listeners, all of our viewers, all of our visitors to dirtfish.com. They have quite literally been hundreds of questions and trying to thin those out and to cut them down has been quite a task. So we'll kick off, shall we, with the first question. And I'm going to uh, direct these questions, gentlemen, to all of you. So, But we'll start off with Rich for this one uh, to answer first, if you don't mind. And it comes from Trevor Howard through Instagram. And Trevor says, what would you do if you could to help the WRC entice more teams into the sport so that more top-class drivers could get a drive and thus making it more exciting. So, Richard, if you could do one thing to get more drivers into the sport, what would it be? Uh, well, I think we're already doing it. You know, we know we've got to be, um, we've got to be really, uh, work really hard on the cost-saving measures um, because ultimately that's what, what stops people coming along and open up the, 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 the cars and the, um, the regulations to attract more, to more teams. But as for more drivers, I think, you know, we're, uh, we're already looking everywhere. M Sport does it a lot with the talent searching. And I think one thing we've seen from this lockdown is the amount of people that have gone to online racing. And maybe that's something we need to consider in the future about how to get people interested in the sport and how we can then work out that transition from from online gaming into reality and real life driving. So 
I think there's a few things we can learn from what we've seen, um, but I think we're actually on the right path and the right direction to get more people in. So we'll keep working on that, I think, is the, is the easiest way to go forward. Yeah, that makes an awful lot of sense, Rich. Andrea, what would you say? Would you uh, agree with what Richard said? Or is there anything in particular that you would be doing that's not being done just now to bring more teams in? I think that uh, to allow new teams coming in, we maybe let them uh, uh, be in step by step, uh, like the old days, and not oblige them from the world more to participate to all the events. Uh, maybe allow them uh, to do step by step in a two, three year plan. Uh, and then we have to see in the case how to manage uh, the uh, points and all these kind of things. But uh, maybe now the situation with so many rallies that uh, we have to see if they remain in the future. To oblige them to start from the world go to all the championship may be a bit tricky. So let me say, to make an example, no, if we all remember what uh, C20 did, uh, they started 21, in 2001. 2002 and then in 2003 they did the, the world the, 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 the world uh, championship so it could be an idea to uh to let someone to not put all the money on the table in one go so andrea from that would you suggest then that perhaps to win a manufacturer's championship if it was a 10 round championship would you advocate seven or eight point scoring rounds to give manufacturers that flexibility that they could choose their, their top seven or eight rounds but uh, this is something that has to be thought uh, more deeply M maybe i suggest just for the new entry you know that uh, they are allowed to participate to a step up number of events well, that's an interesting concept tommy what about yourself uh, anything that you would like to see introduced to encourage new teams into the championship yeah, well, there is, sure, sure, it is very difficult question and all these ideas were very good. So, <laughs> we all know that it's, uh, it's very expensive and also big number of rallies, 14, 14 rounds and uh, maybe plan to even more. It is, uh, it's uh, expensive whatever ways we are doing it. Uh, one thing what I, I, I would say when I was there an early day, there was less number of rallies and longer, longer preparation and uh, kind of different, different uh, well, Reiki was longer, longer and, and people had, uh, drivers had a time to stop to discuss with the people and it was like a more like a, like um, communication and uh, in in countryside with the people during the recce and well it was different it's uh, it's no ways to no way to to be on that it's uh, it's surely surely different time now but uh, i would say one thing i have uh, noticed that uh, maybe maybe it would be some way some way make the the regulation and homologation and all these areas a little bit easier for different even for privateers to join at the moment it's pretty difficult for privateers to join of course they can they could but maybe 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 some more some more chances for that area to make it easier even own homologation and own own production of the car with the privateers well, here's an interesting one from Darren, from Darren Parker, and this came through Facebook. And Tommy, I'll, as you're talking, we'll, uh, we'll throw this one at you to start with, because you mentioned finances and you mentioned costs. And Darren says, should a financial spending cap be introduced, a bit like Formula One, to allow the sport to look more attractive to new teams uh, and maybe to level the playing field a little bit? So should we be looking, Tommy, at a spending cap, which would allow perhaps new teams to come in and uh, compete on a level playing field. What do you think of that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think all the speculation from uh, where, where we are, I think they're very close to the truth. You, you think we've effectively got a spending cap already with the regulations? <laughs> I don't know. Hard to say. I, I, don't, I, I cannot say what, what could be. Would it be any, any good idea? Richard, what do you think about that? What do you think about potentially, you know, a Formula One-style spending cap in the World Rally Championship? 
I think um, in it, on paper, yes. In reality, it's very difficult. I think if you look at Formula One now, they're even struggling to understand how they're going to uh, implement this and they're having to uh, employ uh, a lot of additional people to, um, to actually... Uh, do all the paperwork and make sure that people uh, adhere to the um, the spending cap. And there's probably always way, ways around a spending cap. Um, but I think there's there's certainly some elements we could look to um, to control a little bit more. Uh, and I think again we're actually doing that behind the scenes in the best possible way. Uh, but an actual general spending cap will be very difficult to control, uh, and you don't want to spend too much resources on trying to do that when you and take it away from the sport in general. You know, at the moment we've had three incredibly incredibly close years of competition uh, with no spending cap, so you've got to look at some positives as well from that, um, and not necessarily say the answer to more people is just to stop people spending money. No, I think that's a very good point. And Andrea, you know, we do remember um, back to the S2000 days, there was, there was a spending cap, if you like, on well, a cost cap on S2000 cars, wasn't there? Around about €170,000. I think the Skoda ultimately ended up at nearly €300,000. So, you know, much as on paper spending caps do appear to be attractive, they are very, very troublesome, Andrea. Formula One already tried once uh, to, made, uh, to have a spending cap and it failed. And uh, when I will see the spending cap applied uh, in the future, I will trust it. Uh, I don't believe it. I think that uh, there are rules for the cap to be written properly to manage the money. But uh, as I always say, the, 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 the spending cap uh, will be always uh, the budget that every manufacturer, everyone has available. This is the real spending cap because uh, I really like to understand how you can manage a spending cap or how you can control a spending cap. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's a fairly firm no from all three of you to the proposal for a spending cap. Uh, let's move on. Move on. Uh, this question comes in from Dan Evans. No relation whatsoever to Dirtfish's own David Evans. Uh, Dan asked this one through Instagram, and he says, what do you think about introducing a rule to the WRC where each team has to fully fund, and I'm asking the question as it's written, fully fund an academy for young aspiring drivers? So I guess, you know, if we look at that in a slightly different way, Richard Milner, uh, what about the third car rule? What about the third car being... Uh, allocated purely to young drivers that come through some academy that's managed by the teams. What what do you think about that? Does that have potential to introduce new young drivers, Richard? I think we're uh, we're quite close at the moment. Most of the teams are doing something. Uh, you know, we we're using Gus at the moment, who's come through the academy. Um, Tommy's got uh, Takamoto, and, and Andrea's got Pierre Louis coming along. So I think we're all. We've all got a young driver in there. Uh, that step to WRC, though, is is huge. Um, and that's probably the hardest step to manage. But I think, uh, you know, having having um, some, some official factory drivers in the R5 category is something that we all need to have. And we all have had in the past. And I think we've all shown how positive that is. And that's what we've attempted to do with WRC2 Pro. And I think that's where we need to concentrate on. Um, because the budget to get the WRC cars at the moment is is very high, uh, and this current situation will make it probably more difficult for us all to have more and more WRC cars. Uh, and I think the talent is really shown in that R5 category because because the competition is so tight there, and there's so many other people in the same class of cars that can can fight the the guys employed by the the works teams and really prove if they should be in that seat or not. So I think we've got a pretty good system in place. Um, and we need to work on strengthening WRCT Pro and, and the understanding of that championship and make sure that continues to grow. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Tommy, would you, would you agree with that, that there's no need to formalise that process, that there is enough being done by the teams just now to encourage young drivers and to give young drivers the opportunity? Yeah, it is quite complex, quite difficult. Of course, we are all, always, as a team, we are looking the best best uh, driver lines line up and, and drivers line up and uh, so <laughs> I, I I would say our our third driver got the license a year ago and 
last year and, and he's already in the rally car. That's what we could do. To have, <laughs> he, we have a youngest driver and, and uh, doing well. And we have paid attention already for that area quite a lot. We would like to, as uh, Rich mentioned, we have a Katsuta Takamoto project and, and Kalle Rovampere, a young driver. And, and we are looking all the time and we are keeping our eyes open and looking possibilities to, to support them. Yeah, no, I think what a job you're doing with uh, certainly Kali Rovan Perra, but Takamoto-san looks really, really exciting as well, Tommy. I think he uh, he really is doing an exceptional job in the car for you. It's good to see those young drivers coming through. Andrea, what about yourself? We're seeing certainly an awful lot more youngsters in Hyundai's at the start of this year. Your R5 programme is going well. Do you think there's a need, Andrea, to formalise this step up process into WRC cars? Should we, put, we be putting regulations around it or not? No, I don't think. Definitely, as you say, though, we are pushing a lot after. Also, in our third car, we are investing a lot in two young guys. One is a French guy that I think uh, will have a good future. It's a full mass, as I slope, uh, he's a young guy, and uh, we alternate him also with another young Spaniard that, that I think we have a bright future. It's very short. Uh, we are investing a lot uh, in French, you know, French and Spanish uh, young guys. Yeah, it's, it, you know what? I, I think it's now an awful lot healthier in terms of young drivers progressing into WRC than it's been for a long time. And it is good to see all three of our manufacturers encouraging young drivers into the championship. Uh, let's move on, gentlemen. Let's move on to the calendar. Because obviously, you know, we're, we're in a hiatus right now. We're sitting, we're waiting for the championship to resume. And we don't really know, none of us know, when that's going to happen. So a lot of our questions from our viewers, our listeners, relate to that and how we might complete a championship this year. So uh, Martin Curtis asks through Twitter, he says, in the event that only two months were available, which is possible at the end of the season, is there possibilities for changing the format of rallies to maximise the number of rallies that we can fit in this year? And should we be looking to do that? Tommy, what do you think? Should we be looking to maybe a different type of format to rallies to get them in before the end of the year? Or do we just effectively write the season off. Which way would you look at it, Tommy? Yeah, well, uh, it's been already quite a lot of discussion and, and Rich had uh, some, some good idea also. also and so uh, it's a very difficult question uh, how we could, how we could uh, do because I'm, uh, we, are, we are thinking to do more rallies. It is, it's a bit bit challenging because we always need long weekend anyway for doing one event and uh, so traveling and moving all equipments to another place doing the service for the for the cars so one quest one one idea when, when one one question which has been under discussion is to reduce the mileage which uh, which uh, should allow us also maybe should allow us to do maybe two rallies without bigger like a connected rallies. This would be one way to do easier and faster if we do let's say 250 kilometers per event. We could do two rallies without bigger service. Just go to the to the next destination and do the rally, and then then maybe that would be one one possibility. Yeah, I think there is certainly going to be the need for some innovative thinking. And Rich, you know, if, if someone said to you, look, what we're going to do is we're going to run a one-day rally sprint with one stage run three times with no spectators. Is that better, Rich, than no rally at all? Would you consider that? Yeah, I think we have to be careful not to completely lose the, um, the spirit of what we're trying to do. But at the same time, I think we're in a very different situation to what we, any of us expected and certainly shorter events is possible you know we've seen what we did in in Mexico and in Sweden when we unfortunately weren't able to complete full distances and we both had good rallies there so I think we can do it but we also need to make sure that we're actually reducing the whole length of the week because it's, it's okay just doing shorter days but if we're still going and coming back on the same day that we're going normally then we're not really saving much 
So there are discussions going on between all the teams in the FIA to obviously see what we can achieve this year. And our aim is to do as many events as we can. But I think the reality is we have to wait and see what the different countries allow and how, how much we're going to be able to move around. And then we make the best of that situation at that point. But I think the only other thing is this, a lot of sports are looking to go closed doors, behind closed doors. But I think that's not really possible with rally. And I don't think we we can afford to, to kind of dumb down the show by just saying we'll try and close the doors and do it behind 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 the scenes but i think we need a few more weeks to see what happens and then go from there yeah andre there's definitely an awful lot of challenges ahead for the sports uh, in terms of you know producing a product that, that we can put out there that we can sell that we can run safely uh you know is there a chance that before the end of the, you know, the season might be over that we might not see any rallying before the end of this year of course, we have to face the reality. The reality is not clear so far. Because as Richard said, uh, we don't know what the, each uh, country is going to allow to happen or not. And uh, I think, I permit to say, we cannot discard the economical backfire that we may have. Uh, because now, of course, uh, rightly, everyone is a focus on the coronavirus situation, about the health to manage the virus. But uh, uh, sadly, I don't want to be too much pessimistic, but as soon as emotional and healthy side will uh, go down, we have to face the reality. As uh, we all are uh, connected somehow to an automotive, uh, Manufacture. Mm. Mm, we have to see what uh, we will face this year. But uh, Colin, I permit to say we have to think also already now about next year because uh, the, the budget, uh, the money available will be different. So, as we uh, say, we have to discuss already for this year about uh, how we will face 2021, which actions uh, we have to consider and to already put in place now for next year because uh, I think that the picture will be more tricky maybe than what we can imagine now. So, I, you know what? I think that's quite a good time to move on to the next lot of questions and they concern hybrids and the new hybrid regulations and future rules. Andrea, I'm going to stick with you because you talked about the development for next year and then beyond. Uh, John asks about John Fisk on Twitter. He asks about the hybrid technology and, and do we think that now is the right time to introduce new technologies that cost extra development uh, in terms of looking at the coronavirus, looking at potentially the budget restraints that may be on the teams? Is now the right time to be investing in hybrid? That's from John. To you, Andrea. This is maybe the most tricky question so far. As everything, there is not uh, a clear yes and no in this moment about it, in my opinion. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, to consider that uh, maybe after this crisis, uh, maybe, I don't know, who knows, by the way, uh, the focus on uh, pollution uh, or uh, hybrid and these things will be even stronger, I don't know. So in a tricky moment, uh, Maybe to have uh, hybrid cars uh, will give us the last, uh, uh, let me say, kick uh, to let uh, the manufacturer be happy to be involved, no? Because uh, this is also the the, 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 the picture. Uh, it's difficult in this moment uh, to understand what, uh, I guess, each manufacturer is, uh, is keen to have or not uh, in the global situation. Uh, we for sure uh, are doing the rules that uh, will allow us uh, to also spend less, uh, even if uh, this hybrid thing uh, is uh, something that everyone is looking at, uh, like an expensive uh, jeep mobile. If you manage it uh, yeah. equally, it will not, you know? So, mamma mia, as we say in Italy, it's a trick <laughs> question. Uh, I hope uh, to have um, an answer in with my colleagues in the next months, because uh, uh, this is something that uh, is one of the, not uh, sorry for these uh, funds, but uh, also for ourselves, I think it's one of the difficult to answer questions so far. And is why I think that we are facing uh, 
a tricky moment also for motorsport. Tommy, what about yourself and Toyota's view on that? Is it possible that we could be looking at a development freeze for the next year or two? Is that a possibility? Or are you quite happy that we should be pushing ahead, developing the hybrids and moving on with the current set of regulations that are being formulated just now? Uh, as, as you all know that Toyota have, a, Toyota have already good knowledge from uh, hybrid technology and they've been competing competing also with hybrid car and in in VEC serial, serial uh, VEC car and, and uh, so of course they we are ready to ready to continue continue and do the development for for that the new new 2022 regulation of course we would like to see the new car because uh, because hybrid is uh, technology which is which is future technology also in, in rally cars, sure. And uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we are ready to look all different possibilities to, to go forward and show the direction, whatever, whatever, whatever possibility, whatever. But uh, uh, I think uh, we should have a clearly kind of uh, working group we in includes all manufacturers and FIA and different and pick a number of uh, number of people working group to, to discuss and think about future and what what the latest what would be the latest technology in the future and and uh, and uh, is there any 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 other topics what we could bring also Tommy, it's, it's what rallying's been all about, really. It's been a, a proving ground, hasn't it, for technologies in the past? And that's what's attracted manufacturers, the opportunity to come up with innovative new ideas, innovative new technologies, and to test them in the most demanding circumstances. Maybe hybrid isn't quite enough in that direction, Tommy. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. It is old technology already, and... and uh... As uh, we know that quite a lot discussion about the different kind of uh, kind of different kind of uh, uh, fuel example would be one good uh, direction to think about carefully. How about the synthetic fuels? And uh, what else? There could be many, many, many re renewable uh, items and and materials and things, whatever, to make it more green. Yeah. Yeah, you, you get your crystal ball out, Tommy, and have a look at the crystal ball, because I think the crystal balls are all a little bit murky just now, aren't they? Nobody knows really what's going to happen. Rich, what do you think, though, about hybrid? What do you think about, I suppose, a potential freeze on development going forward? Is that something that you would debate, that you would uh, get involved with? Or are you quite happy to push ahead with the regulations as they're being developed, Rich? I think we've got to be a little bit careful with jumping the gun and saying let's freeze everything and stop and, and wait and see because as Andrea said we know this year and next year is going to be difficult but we've got to think of 2022 is still quite a long way away yet and uh, we would all hope that the uh, the world will be somewhere on its way to recovering from what's going on at the moment but if you stop now and, uh, and, and delay everything then um, you could end up in more more trouble than you started by by trying to carry on now while we still have the opportunity to carry on what we're doing with the 2022 cars is possible to do without events um and and we can make good use of this time and i think there's a lot i've seen and read a lot of comments about the introduction of hybrid and and it being negative on rallying but i think you know what we're doing we're everybody that's involved in these decision makes uh, making the exercises are fans of the sport we're not about to try and kill the sport off with hybrid i think hybrid is actually something that will really add to the uh, the spectacle and the performance and another element of the series and although like you say it's technology that already exists it's not necessarily about bringing brand new technology to the sport we need to mirror our rally cars need to mirror what's going on in the showrooms and what our manufacturers are selling and that's the point we're missing at the moment because the cars we use at the minute are not really relevant to the the lineup of models that the manufacturers have so I think we're catching up a little bit in that way. But then at the same time, 
um, being able to push forward and develop the sport as we go along. So I definitely don't think we should be stopping um, and we need to push on and, and stay positive and aim for 2022. Can I, can I throw in one of my own questions to you, Rich? Um, and it, it seems, and I, I feel very selfish because we have got hundreds of questions, but I am going to ask one of my own questions. Uh, when we have these development meetings to develop and to discuss new regulations going forward in the WRC, it was pointed out to me that rather than engineers, really we should have manufacturer accountants and marketeers in those meetings. Because as you say, what's missing right now is, the, in some ways, the link to the road car. And OK, we're seeing that with Toyota, we're seeing it with Hyundai and with Ford as well moving forward. But what do you think about the proposal to put marketeers and accountants into these development meetings in terms of regulation development? <laughs> I think you'd have to be a brave accountant to take on a room full of engineers. <laughs> but uh, I think it's always a difficult one. An engineer will, will engineer a problem to the nth degree with no worry about budget at all at this level um, but at the same time a lot of the engineers involved in WRC cars have been involved in R5 cars which have been very well budget capped um, and I think they do have an understanding that we do need to to make it sensible in order for us all to be there uh, and I think the three manufacturers we have at the moment work very well together and um, both Tommy and Andrea and, and everyone at M Sport can see both sides of the fence and you need good engineering challenge because you need to keep the people you have employed and interested in, in making a car that's better than the others, but at the same time not going out of control and end up in a situation where you've got no manufacturers left because it's not a fair competition. So it's very easy to add extra people to meetings, but I think there's already two, three different sets of meetings that go on and trying to add any more in would you dilute the problem and then you don't come up with a good answer. So I think you've got to be careful on how many people you involve in the decision-making process. I suppose my follow-up to that to you, Andrea, if you, yeah, Andrea, my follow-up to that to you would be, have we got the right people in those meetings? Uh, if we're talking about having too many people, are the right people developing our sport or pushing our sport in the right di direction? Uh, in terms of the rural development? Is it the right people that are sitting in and developing those regulations? As I'm getting older, this has been <laughs> the first time in my life, short, <laughs> of course, a very short experience in motorsport, that I seen the rules uh, growing up and developing and developing uh, with the proper approach. I have to say, being an engineer, I take the right uh, to say that engineers sometimes are the most uh, dangerous uh, entities uh, in motorsport because uh, they have no contact with reality. As uh, Richie said, sometimes they are just spending money for the sake of spending money. And I have to say that the way this rule has been uh, developed uh, from January ongoing, uh, seeking the proper people around the table, putting clear calls that have to drive uh, the, the direction of the rules uh, and now with a clear uh, control of what engineers are doing uh, is the proper way because I think we are in the right of uh, smart cars, smart and new cars that uh, will have the uh, inputs uh, that uh, we have been asked with everyone by the marketing uh, people, not uh, accountants because accountants normally they do not want to spend money and the engineering uh, background. So I think that is the first time in my life that I've seen something that uh, should be uh, okay till the end, that we are not doing the crazy things that will just uh, kill the, the championship. You know, it's from years that I see nice uh, rules that are growing up, 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 up expensive kills that you start from uh, uh, something very cheaper and easy that goes up, 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 that became expensive. You know, it's like the movie, I don't know the English name in Italy, is, was uh, like uh, uh, every day, Ricomincio da Cap, no? starts from scratch. That is the guy that every morning wake up and is doing the same things. And uh, sadly, in the last 30 years, I was seeing that. Well, it's good to see things are 
quite clearly changing, Andrea, and that's quite encouraging what you're saying about, you know, the processes. And Tommy, it's interesting to get Andrea's approach. We're all team bosses, obviously. Andrea comes from an engineering background. Rich comes from, I suppose, a business background. You come from a driver's background, Tommy. Would you agree with what both Rich and Andrea are saying about the development of the rules? Are we going about it in the right way? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a very tricky question. It is, uh, uh, it's not the, uh, I, I know that it's very, very huge challenge for, for FIA at the moment to find, find good solution to make everybody happy. One of the things I would like to remind, I would like to remind when the, the current car, the current regulation started beginning of 2017 when the, the cars were developed to make looking more spectacular and more powerful. It was also immediately increasing the number of fans from, from previous cars from 2016. And how was the effect last time? What was the effect when from uh, cars before the previous regulation, which was two liter, two liter turbocharged engine. And then they, they came down to 1.6, everybody, I remember there was quite a strong rumor that uh, uh, at 1.6, they're not powerful at all. It was quite a negative rumor, but now when, when 2017 regulation, it was very, very positive rumor when, when we informed that uh, horsepowers will be increased up to close 400 horsepowers, which was everybody excited, everybody excited how the cars were looking, are looking at the moment. We, I would say we need to also remember we have already R5 car, which is very, very close to our road cars looking, uh, very identical to and sassy and some modification from it's close to group n which was which was one of the longest lasting category since started very 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 long time ago and it was because it was so little changes with the regulation and it stays like a, like a very close to close to road car but it was not the main category. Main, the rally car is the highest level of like Formula One. And I think that car should be still looking very, very spectacular for the uh, fans because that ma makes their interest to follow the rallying. If they are really, they are coming to see something which is absolutely, hey, we want to see, this is absolutely something. It's like a moon rocket on, on gravel roads. But uh, R5 is already category there, which is lower, cate lower, lower category for normal uh, customers all over the world and big number of R5 cars already existing. Do you know what's really interesting, Tommy, and it backs up the point you're making, is that from the hundreds of questions that we've had, no one is asking whether R5 or R5 Plus should be the new World Rally category. There is clearly a place for R5, as you rightly say, clearly a place in filling a, a massive need amongst the national championships, a secondary division within the World Championship. But not a single question, Tommy, saying or asking whether R5 should be the WRC class. It backs up your point that people want spectacular. They want to hear, they want to step back two or three steps from the stage when the cars come past. They want to be excited by the noise. We need to maintain that. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely agree with you on, on that area because it's, uh, we, we need to remember we are doing this, uh, this uh, sport for fans. And if we are, we are doing some new regulation which decrease their interest, I'm, I'm not sure if it is a good idea. I think you're absolutely right. OK, gentlemen, that's, uh, that's the hybrids and the future rules. A, a very interesting question. I'm going to direct this one at you, Andrea. Uh, a very, very interesting question. And it comes, <laughs> comes from the Cali Rovanpera fan club. Uh, but it is a pretty decent question. Uh, so, I, so I will ask it of all three of you. And the Cali Rovanpera fan club through Instagram are asking us, which driver would you swap 
from one of the other teams. If you had the chance to steal a driver from one of the other teams, Andrea, which driver would it be and why? Uh, I think Evans. Oh, that's interesting. And why? Because I don't have the money to pay Jose. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. I didn't expect a detailed answer from you on that one. Richard, we'll move to you. If you could steal one of Andrea's drivers or one of Tommy's drivers, Rich, who would you steal and why would you steal them? I think, uh, yeah, if, if Elvin's gone now, then uh, then then we had two fantastic years with Seb. So uh, if he wants to come back again, he's more than welcome. What was so special about Seb, do you think, Richard? What makes him so special? What makes him just such a wonderful asset to a team? I think uh, we got into a situation where you went to a rally and you, you had no kind of uh, thoughts about, you know, is it going to be a good rally or a bad rally? At the end of the day, he was always so consistent with everything he did. Very professional in the way he, he acted and, and did everything. And, you know, ultimately he had the speed and and could live with any of the tactics or mind games being played by anybody else. And he was such a strong character mentally. And, and Julian was 100% committed as well. And I think, um, you know, all, all upcoming drivers need to need to look at uh, the way he, he dealt with himself in those two years because they were very difficult championships to win. And, and if, you can, if you can follow those kind, of, um, those kind of ways, then I think you'd do very well. And I think, honestly, that's uh, where, where a similar path that Elvin's taking and we've seen at the start of this year. Uh, exactly what he he was p potentially capable of, and unfortunately, again, it looks like a tough year for him. You know, a great start, and now it's been interrupted. But yeah, I think we had two really good years for Seb, and and ones we won't forget. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Now, Tommy, a lot of people say you already have the dream team at Toyota, but if you could take one other driver from anywhere in the service park, who would it be, Tommy, and why would you take them? Uh, you're right. I'm. Uh, uh... We absolutely happy at the moment to have a drivers and, and I, I wouldn't like to do any changes. I'm just uh, waiting and waiting and looking forward to be in next rally where we, wherever we are. <laughs> oh, Tommy, am I going to let you off with that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm going to let you off with that, Tommy. Uh, listen, maybe think a little bit out of the box. Anyone in the service park. I mean, you could, you could, you could even have Malcolm Wilson if you wanted. You know. <laughs> well, uh, um, maybe, maybe it would be nice to see uh, Carlos' father as well. Yes, yes, that would be quite a nice team. Yeah, maybe, maybe sitting in the co-driver's seat next to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Father and father and son in the same team. That would be one of them. One nev never seen before. <laughs> that would be quite something. Gentlemen, right, thank you very much for your answers to those questions. I really appreciated uh, your honesty and uh, your insights into those. I thought there were really good questions that came in from all of our uh, Dirtfish friends out there. We have some specific questions now for you. So if you don't mind, I know your time is very, very important. I think we've got around about 10 minutes left. So I have some specific questions for each of you. So we will start, seeing as Richard, you are first on my list. Uh, now these reasonably quick, quick answers to these ones, Rich, because there are a few to get through. Um, so Richard Milner. Uh, this one I don't understand. It's from Wayne99 on Twitter. Is Rolly Molly still sweeping up, Richard Milner? Rally Molly. That's Molly Taylor. Uh, she, she, might be, <laughs> she might be sweeping up somewhere, but she's certainly not sweeping up for us anymore. She used to work with me. I think it was the worst time of her, worst period of her career working with me, but uh, she's done okay since. She has done okay. She's, she's still driving with Subaru, I believe, in, uh, in Australia. Uh, from Brian Lord on Facebook, with a very tight budget, how does M Sport balance the budget for needing to develop the World Rally car to stay competitive and allocating funding for drivers and the R5 programme? Balancing the budget, Rich, how do you do it? Good question. Um, very difficult sometimes, but that's why our customer base is so strong and our customer programme is is almost takes priority over WRC team sometimes and we have to use the the funding and the profits from the the WR, from the customer sales to help um, 
with the funding we get for the World Rally Team and balance it that way. And as, as people know, we use a lot of upcoming drivers that that um, are good good cost effectively and um, use that to our advantage and, and develop a lot of good drivers. Very good. And Dylan Williams asks on Facebook uh, about Elvin. Is Elvin's change of pace and performance down to him being more relaxed in a factory car without perhaps the concerns of budget that you talked about there, Richard, that he had at M Sport? Uh, I think maybe there's a little bit, but I also think the the main thing is, you know, he's he's moved. He knows that this is his opportunity to prove and probably this will make or break his career. And I think at that point then, um, you know, he knew that he had to, to push on. And I think regardless of the team he was in, he was turning a, a corner at the end of last year um, and showed in the first few rallies this year exactly how good he is. So, yeah, good luck to him. And we all want to we all want to see him a world champion. Good. And good luck to you, Richard. Thank you very much. We'll just come back to you in a little bit. But we have some questions for you, Andrea. Uh, now, here's an interesting one from Hyundai Races through Twitter. He says, where do the retired Hyundai i20 World Rally cars end up after the season is over? I think it was, was it uh, Mitsubishi used to cut them all up, the World Rally cars? What, what do you do with your World Rally cars? Are they sold on? What happens to them? But we are starting to sell some of them. Uh, so far, we sold the three, and uh, that's it for this year. And for next year, we will see what is going on. Of course, uh, we sold them before this uh, big crisis. No, so I have to say uh, I'm uh, looking forward to see if someone will still have the money to pay them. After. I think it will. Well, I, I, Richard Milner might be able to uh, confirm this, but but I hear that in the past people have bought cars off M Sports with watches. They've swapped watches for cars. Maybe maybe you can become a watch dealer, Andre, and swap cars for watches. I, I tried to speak with my board and CFO if uh, they accept uh, maybe watches, uh, axe, uh, and cake, uh, this kind of exchange <laughs> stuff uh, to pay WRC cars, but. <laughs> Here's a good one for you. It's from Brian Lord through Facebook. Uh, how much direct design input do you personally have into the cars, Andrea, into the aero and the design of the cars? We know you come from an engineering background, but do you leave it to the engineers or do you personally have much input into the design of the cars? My input is zero. In fact, the cars are competitive. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but you must be tempted, though. You must be tempted to get involved in those discussions, at least. I think in life uh, you have to know which is your role and do well your job and uh, try to let the people working with you to do their job at the best. Because or you trust your people or you do not. No? So if I trust my people, I let them uh, work. If I do not trust, I have to change them and I trust them 100%. And, uh, I cannot do everything myself. I'm busy enough to manage the problem that I have without uh, giving people to forget. As I said, you maybe I'm too old uh, to put in. Uh, I don't want to design stuff uh, old-fashioned when we need the new stuff now. Fantastic, Andrea. Thank you very much for that. Tommy, a few questions for you as well. Uh, now, now, this, I think, comes from the same person, Brian Lord, on Facebook for you, Tommy. Uh, how has the development of the car changed with having two mechanics as drivers? You know, we know Oit and Evans are both very good mechanics. And, you know, how much input do your engineers incorporate into the driver viewpoint? So has it changed with having two drivers who are very technically minded in the team, Tommy? Of course, it's important for communication. Communication and information share with us is one of the most important thing we follow and 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 uh, uh, we discussing together we discussing together with engineers and drivers all of them and we we try to try to understand their needs and and try to go forward and improve the card for for all of them and uh, it's uh, it's uh, i think it is uh, Communication together with all, uh, that's been since we started very, very important. We discuss 
I'm part of the part of the team to discussing because I have uh, some experience. We pick all different, all little topics here and there, and we try to put them together. And finally, I would say, I would say, as long as the the car has been improved already quite a few years, I think it is such a small differences with the drivers. They are, they are. Their, their setup. It's very, very. It's a, all, all of them. They have a very, very setup close together. Very good. Yeah, it's clearly working, Tommy. It really is. Uh, now, one more question for you, Tommy. It comes from Miguel Vieira through Instagram, and he says to you particularly, Tommy, what was your favourite Group B car, and what was your first ever rally car? So your favourite Group B car and your favourite rally car. Uh, f uh, favorite Group B car, I would say Audi. Last last Audi Quattro, how you however you call it. What was the S S one or what was the the short short big, with big wings? That was one of the spectacular one, which I remember. Followed. Uh, next uh, rally, Thousand Lakes rally, when Hannu Mikola was absolutely flat out with that car, that car in owning Pohja over the jumps, and uh, it was amazing, amazing vehicle. And uh, first ever rally car was uh, Ford Escort RS2000. That is not a bad car to start with, I'd have to say. Richard Milner nodding his head in approval to that one. Absolutely reliable car. <laughs> Fantastic. Gentlemen, listen, I cannot thank all three of you enough for joining us this morning on our first edition of Dirtfish Debates. It's been an absolute joy, gents. Really good to see you pushing ahead with plans. We're, we're not seeing enough rallying, but it's great to hear your thoughts. Tommy Mackinnon, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And Andrea Adamo, thank you very much for joining us from Alzenau, I think is where you said you were. Yeah, basically, yes. We'll Thank speak you to you again you. soon. Thank you very much, Andrea. And Richard Milner up in Cumbria. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And we'll let you get back to whatever you were up to this morning. You're welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us all at our kitchen tables, in our offices, wherever we were this morning. It's been a joy to have you with us. It's been a joy to see all of your really insightful questions. That was the first edition of Dirtfish Debates.